The, the next presenter is uh, Susan Chang. Susan is a, a cardiologist at the Brigham uh, and runs a program that's really focused on uh, cardiovascular aging. And she's going to talk today about small molecule predictors of outcome after, oh, sorry, about bioactive lipid profiling. Thanks so much, Callum. It's, it's all related at the end of the day. <laughs> um, so our research is focused on the concept of life course trajectories. And what do I mean by that? Well, imagine, if you will, and bear with me with this one, that each of us is a cruise ship. And we've all set sail on a journey called life that should ideally be set on a straight course towards health maintenance and optimal um, quality of life. So if uh, genes are the ship's blueprint and transcriptional factors and proteins were involved in how and with what materials the ships was built, then any storms met along the way are exposures that at any point could divert the ship, steer it off course, and uh, run us into some issues. And so even a slight off course deviation early in life, if not caught and corrected, could lead us to a very undesirable location and situation decades down in life, uh, down later in life. And so the idea really is to find, understand what factors um, uh, are in play that actually cause even slight off-course deviations with respect to our um, health uh, trajectory throughout life, and in turn to identify interventions that allow for us to be able to very effectively enable um, course correction. So how do we do this? My laboratory um, looks specifically at life course trajectories of health versus disease across very large cohorts with serial phenotyping. In order to do this, we've so far amassed almost 100,000 samples from uh, 50,000 individuals who contribute together over 650,000 follow-up years of uh, outcome surveillance. So if we take, for example, uh, the ideal goal of maintaining cardiometabolic health over the life course, we can actually use serial clinical data collected from individuals to categorize these people with respect to, given their known outcomes, with respect to trajectories, ident identifying distinguishing between those who develop disease early in life, later in life, or never at all. So these subset data actually from uh, one of our representative cohorts show that 20 percent of individuals over the course of their lifetime actually stay healthy or have obesity, but never have developed any untoward consequence of that obesity. 20% develop diabetes early in life or later in life, and 60% develop prediabetes. They meet the threshold and the criteria for diagnosing prediabetes, but they never go on to develop um, any overt diabetes. And if you look at the lifetime frequency of CBD across these categories of people, they're as expected with the individuals who develop early onset diabetes having by far the highest risk for lifetime CBD. What's interesting is that the individuals who develop prediabetes but who never go on to develop overt diabetes actually have a three times higher risk of CBD compared to those who are maintain health, uh, lean, uh, a lean status, and, uh, and a healthy status overall over the course of their lifetime. But the real question is why? What are the factors that cause some individuals, some cruise ships, to veer slightly off course um, earlier rather than later, and some, in fact, to actually achieve some sort of at least partial course correction and maintain that over the course of their lifetime. So to understand how people differ, um, we actually in our laboratory assume that all intrinsic and extrinsic exposures um, leave behind a biochemical imprint of their, their effect on the human organism. And so rather than trying to analyze the totality of the uh, diverse small molecules and biochemistry that make up a uh, human in a particular uh, time point when you sample them, we're particularly interested in focusing on those molecules that are most likely to play very important biological roles in the body. And these bioactive lipids are the ones that are particularly important and involved in cell signaling, in endogenous chemical reactions, and in what we know to be very important uh, mechanisms that maintain chemical homeostasis in the body. So these bioactive lipids actually uh, involve um, a very important subset called the costanoids. The costanoids are the small lipid mediators of upstream inflammation. Now, although chronic inflammation is well known to be a hallmark of age-related diseases, we still are, have very limited understanding of the extent to which um, inflammatory pathways interact with each other. Uh, with respect to their roles in facilitating health and healing versus disease development and disease progression. And so um, 
let me just talk a little bit more specifically about acosinoids since I don't have the detail here. Acosinoids, I just want to reemphasize, are a class, a very, very special class of bioactive lipid mediators derived from metabolism of polyunsaturated fatty acids via the enzymatic activity of um, cyclooxygenases, lipoxygenases, cytochrome P450s, and actually also some non enzymatic um, pathways. What's interesting about these particular derivatives of fatty acids is many, although not all, um, are contain uh, 20 carbons, but they all actually invariably, we've discovered, have a very unique, um, very invariably all have this very unique uh, chemical structural fingerprint that allows for them to be detected and quantified through high-throughput uh, th high screening method that has never been uh, described before. And so using this uh, advanced technology, our results, we've applied this now in several cohorts, and these are data from one of the representative cohorts. Our results to date show that it's possible to detect actually over 500 distinct acosinoid molecules in human plasma, with the vast majority being measurable in, in this cohort, it's 3,000 people. So the vast majority are actually measured in over 80 percent of every single person in this cohort. And you can see in panel B that the uh, acosinoids demonstration intercorrelations that um, suggest shared biosynthetic pathways or shared origins. Furthermore, and most importantly, these acosinoids uh, demonstrate that they can be actually highly informative with respect to cardiometabolic disease risk. So here I'm showing from the same cohort several unique acosinoid species that are actually uh, representing different pathways and are associated with increased risk for diabetes, potentially um, representing pathways of harm. And an almost similar number of acosinoids representing uh, mirror or alternate uh, acosinoid pathways are associated with lower risk for diabetes, possibly reflecting uh, protective mechanisms. Many of these same acosinoids are also associated with cardiometabolic risk factors at baseline, and in particular, certain acosinoids are associated with change in fasting plasma glucose over time, potentially uh, representing a link to pathophysiology. And so why are we interested in acosinoids in general? Not just because they're small lipid mediators of upstream inflammation, but also because, very importantly, they're extremely ripe therapeutic targets. So depending on the disease outcome, in this case cardiometabolic risk, we can actually map the top associated acosinoids to enzymatic pathways, such as those leading to the production of prostaglandins, lipoxins, et cetera. Moreover, we know that existing FDA drugs modulate enzymatic activity for these same pathways. But the real question is how specifically and to what extent? A classic paradox underlying age-related diseases, as many of you in the room know, has to do and is centered on cyclooxygenase. We all know that the non-selective COX inhibitor aspirin clearly reduces cardiovascular risk, whereas COX-2 inhibitors clearly increase cardiovascular risk if you look hard enough, the signal is there, while at the same time clearly reduces risk for cancer, in particular colon cancer. And so how do we go about trying to understand this paradox? Now with the ability to interrogate acosinoid pathways comprehensively as well as in a very granular fashion, we can actually start to get at the how, the why and potentially start to unravel this particular paradox. For instance, in one of our cohorts, chronic aspirin use is associated with very significantly elevated levels of certain acosinoid species and significantly lower levels of other acosinoid species. If we look in particular at those individuals who are chronically taking NSAIDs, you can actually see similar variation, this time involving a greater number of acosinoids. And if you look at the individuals who are chronically taking a statin, you can see a much larger swath of, of possible acosinoid targets, of course, reflecting pleiotropy. And so we expect um, that acosinoids, because they're involved in the fundamental processes underlying all responses to stress, they offer important insights regarding not only medications with, uh, with inflammatory and immune modulating effects, but also dietary, physical uh, activity and other non-pharmacologic interventions. I should mention that we've also looked at ARBs and ACEs in these cohorts, and we can actually see, especially in some of our smaller cohorts with repeated sampling, that uh, people on ACEs and ARBs also demonstrate chronically elevated, chronically depressed, or progressive change in certain acosinoid species, which is very interesting. So in summary, we're now using samples and data from large cohorts as well as available intervention studies with time series data to better understand how available drugs can be better dosed and better targeted. And also, um, these of course offer the ability to hone the development of novel therapeutics for mod uh, modulating age-related disease, all towards the ultimate goal, of course, of achieving a life course uh, corrections for those who need it. 
For all this work, we're very interested in partnerships that will help us to continue our forward momentum. In addition, the cardi in addition to the cardiometabolic analyses that I've just shown you here today, we're interested in co-investments um, in furthering our work, which we have started um, in relating acosinoids to other diseases and other phenotypes. We are also just right now in the preparation phase of uh, starting some interventional studies um, that will look specifically at the degree to which certain acosinoid species are uh, modulated in the setting of different doses of aspirin in different types of people. And of course, at the end of the day, we understand that and we recognize and anticipate that existing therapies are going to be limited, even if they're well tailored, tailored as well as possible. And so we're very interested in partnering um, with uh, organizations to develop novel ther therapeutics and really develop a very careful, refined approach to taking the tank candidate molecules and corresponding enzymes uh, to developing these therapeutics. And of course, at the end of the day, all of these therapeutics will need to be tested in large clinical trials. So thank you very much for your attention.